Good. So, today's topic is to advance a bit further with uh, Python. So we'll uh, do some uh, uh, exercises here in the class, uh, and then you continue uh, in the lab uh, with the same uh, kind of exercises, but uh, uh, on your own. Hmm? So the idea is uh, uh, we, we are seeing up to now language, OK? So writing small programs, uh, understanding um, strings, arrays, dictionaries, uh, and so on. So the data structures and the control statements for the language. Now, what uh, makes Python different or stand out from other languages? And uh, why is the reason that we chose this language in this course? Hmm? Uh, because of its, uh, let's say, very, um, a very high flexibility, I would say, uh, and the really enormous amount uh, of packages and modules uh, that you can find and use for your own purposes. So it would be very easy, uh, easy to do what we call the rapid prototyping. So putting together some code that does a specific task without uh, bothering all the details, without implementing everything. And uh, usually those packages tend to have a very, or a quite easy to use uh, interface, so they can be used. Uh, and they can, you can also access complex functionalities with a simple API. So today we'll try to play a bit with that, trying to have a, a Basically, what we are going to do is to create some small programs in Python that just use functionality provided by libraries or by other tools. Hmm? So the first uh, uh, exercise, sorry, don't look at the second part of the slide. It, it was meant to appear later. So <laughs> um, a simple exercise where a user can write a text onto the console, on the terminal, and the computer speaks that message. OK? So for example, so let me delete this. I don't want to, look, to see it. OK? It's just distracting. Uh, so a terminal where I, I write something, and the computer echoes back the same text to me, but in words. Hmm? Not, not by echoing with a print statement, instead with words. So I think the, the goal is quite clear. Unfortunately, there is no single command or library function or whatever that is able to do this. So we try, in some way, to break, to break the problem in two parts. I have a text that the user just input hmm, on his keyboard, and they want the computer to speak. So actually, I have two steps, two problems, two sub-problems. The second one actually is the end, the last mile, is the end functionality. OK, how do I make the computer speak? Hmm? And uh, the first half, which is, by the way, the more complex one, is how do I determine what kind of sounds to be emitted? So the idea could be to first reason in terms of a, of a file, an intermediate file. So let's split the problem in two. The first half is uh, given a text, can I produce a file? An MP3 file, for example, or a WAV file, or an OGG file in some audio format, OK? A file that contains the spoken text corresponding to that string, first half. Second half, once I have this file, how can I make the computer play it? You answer, yes, just click on it, OK. If I were in an interactive setting, I could just click on the icon corresponding to the file, and the computer will play it. But we want to do it from, from a program, from Python. So we must understand and find 
what are the options for these two tasks? If we can solve the left and the right part of the slide, then if we put them together, we have a program that is able to speak. Right? So we will uh, always iterate and switch between two questions. How can I make a make how can I make a problem simpler? I mean, how can I decompose a problem into smaller sub problems? This is one question that you should ask yourselves all the time. And then where you are on a sub problem, you ask yourself what are the available tools for solving this problem? So what we said is that at the beginning, a, a tool, a program, a command that does all of this, all that we want, doesn't exist. We can find it, OK? We don't find it. So we split the problem in two. We try to decompose the problem into smaller, smaller units. And then, again, on the left side, we ask ourselves, is there any tool for converting a string into an audio file? And on the right hand side, is, uh, the question is, is there a tool or a library or a command or whatever that given an audio file speaks it through the computer speakers? You see, we are, try we are, we are trying to change the way you build programs. Instead of uh, building them bottom up like in C, okay, I need to write each and every single statement. So at the end, you start from the low-level instructions to, for doing something. Uh, here, we, we want to reverse the approach and say, OK, we, we start from the top, from the problem, problem as a whole, and we split it and make it smaller only if it's needed, only if, if I don't find a tool that is already able to work at the high level. Hmm? So this is a simple toy example, but just to, to, to push you in try to think in this way. So converting a text into an audio file, what can you do? We, you do a small Google search. Huh? Half of the, uh, the work is finding the right keywords for your Google search. The second is, of course, understanding the results. But uh, what you come up is that, for example, I searched online, and they found that there are two options for converting a text into an audio file. There's a Google text-to-speech functionality, which is embedded inside Google Translate. You know, hmm, probably, that if you use Google Translate, there's a small icon. Hmm, that lets you lets Google speak the text uh, in, in, in either language. Hmm? That functionality, so internally, Google Translate knows how to convert a text in any language into a spoken audio. We just need to call that functionality. And, uh, for example, another website that turned out uh, to this morning when I'm trying to seek some alternatives is that at our website. So maybe we have a look at those, and we choose which one to use. OK? So first, try to find, in this case, we, we are not talking about uh, Python libraries or commands in Linux or in Ubuntu to do the job. These are web services online. So we, need to, we, we may choose huh, to integrate these online services in our program. These services provide something useful for us. OK, so let's try to learn huh, and how to call them. For today, the interaction will be very, very simple. Huh? But later on, as we learn more about web technologies, we will learn more 
about how to inter interact huh? and in, uh, query and modify and, uh, and find information on web services, hmm? on websites. And uh, b before we delve into the details of, uh, of these two text-to-speech uh, products, uh, the other half, uh, well, I didn't look too much, uh, but I found uh, a very simple player called mPlayer, which is installed or can be installed into Ubuntu. It's a Linux tool. It's a Linux tool that is a, a music player. So like all the music players comes up, uh, it's also a video player, by the way. It comes up with fancy interfaces and a lot of buttons and menus uh, and playlists uh, and whatever you want. But uh, the nice part about this uh, is that you can also uh, Let's say execute it uh, via through a command line without any graphical interface, which is what we are looking for. There are more complex solutions. There are. You you can if you if you search for Pyth uh, Python Play Audio or something like that, you will find a lot of references to libraries. Huh? Python libraries that can play files inside your program. Uh, they usually have a lot of uh, dependencies. So they ask you to install Pygame or another distribution of Python with, uh, with compiled libraries and so on. All the multimedia part is very heavy. And Python as an interpreter language doesn't catch up with the speed. So they need you to install specific compiled C compiled libraries so it's a, you can get there, but it's a bit complex. Uh, we already have a tool. We can just install with apt-get in our system, and we can use it. OK, so let's try to, to stop at the first and simple viable solution. When, and if we later find out that this solution is too simple, is not powerful enough, or whatever, we, we may also always come back and replace it with something more complex or more powerful or more feature-rich or whatever. Okay? Don't strive for perfection at the beginning, for getting everything. Hmm? Try to get as quickly as possible something workable, hmm? a minimum working system. And then you can, so that you have the, the whole functionality ready, then you can improve it and test alternatives, see wh which is faster, which is more efficient, if you care about that. Hmm? Okay, so for example, this time I did the work for you. So I try to dig from messages or from Google searches how to call this Google text-to-speech engine. So it turns out that the functionality is there, but it's not official. It's not officially supported. Huh? Uh, but uh, if you call, this is the normal address of Google Translate, right? Translate.google.com. Then there's a special page, translate underscore TTS. TTS means text to speech. Okay? Text to speech. Translate text to speech, and you can open a page by specifying the translation language, for example, English, and a query like this. So you find a lot of references over the internet that Sending this or opening this web address will give you the audio for that message. Let's try it out. So I go to HTTP POPS. Sorry, HTTP. Translate. Translate. Dot Google. Dot com. I already have it in the history. Translate TTS, translation language English, query hello. 
you find a lot of documents over the internet that say if you write this, you will listen, you will hear the audio. Actually, let's check it. It's usually faster than that. Okay, <clears throat> what happens is that since uh, more or less la last year, one year ago, Google found that the people were using and abusing, actually, uh, say, of this feature. So they blocked this function with a, you know, the CAPTCHA, the computer automated test uh, for telling machines and humans apart, that's the name of the CAPTCHA. So you need to enter a word, I am a human, but I, am, I have some difficulties. No, red. In order to get to the actual audio translation. Okay. So what happens is that half of the internet tells you that you can use this address, but when you try it, it doesn't work anymore. And then you, because, why? Why? Because the API, this mechanism was never officially supported. So they're free to change it, to break it whenever they want. It's their own internal mechanism. So there's a trick, they say it works, that if you append to the string client something, I found this example, Hello. then it works. So you are. Hello. So. <laughs> Uh, in a way, we found a trick to be able to use this without entering the catcher. So be, that means being able to call this page from a program. OK? So actually, what we have here is a, an MP3 file. This is not an HTML file with a nice player embedded. This page, the, the web page just returned the, the, the bare, the naked MP3 file, and the browser is just showing me this uh, control, but this is something inside the browser. What I got is actually an MP3 file. If, I, if you try to save the page, you said it comes out as an MP3 file, not as an HTML page. OK, so this trick today is working. Tomorrow, I don't know. Okay, they can block it. They can. Uh, some messages say that if you are generating too much traffic, they will block your computer for a while. Hmm? We don't know why. And uh, but they are trying to limit, uh, say, the resource consumption on their websites. So this may be an option. I would not build a product, a real system relying on this trick. Hmm? Because from one day to the other, it may break, so my customers can ring me and say, what, what have you sold me? It's not working anymore. Hmm? Uh, but for making a prototype, just for checking if our concept is, is good, it's quick. It's one solution. Today is working. So for, for today, it's enough. If, since we are in the prototyping phase, it's OK to have something that maybe needs to be replaced later. But for now, let's check if the, the whole project has, uh, um, is, is feasible. There is this uh, alternative. Huh? I found this other website, Voice RSS, hmm? which is another but totally different website. 
Right? That tells you in advance what you can get from them. So, for example, they say that uh, if you if you make less than 350 daily requests, the service is free. You can only input plain text and not uh, benefit from other additional functions. But anyway, 350 messages per day are free. If you need more, okay, you may pay. Okay, five bucks a month or 15 a month and so on. If you want to have a higher number of uh, translations or say text-to-speech conversions per day. So it's an alternative possibility. This one, they declare it. It's free up to a limit. Over that limit, you need to pay. And is it more difficult to use? Actually, no. If I go to the API, means the program interface, say that in order to, to get started with the text-to-speech API, you need to get the API key. So what is the API key? It's a string, a numerical string, that identifies different users. You need to apply to get a key so that everyone maybe gets a different key, and everyone gets his own 300 uh, and whatever free messages per day. If we all use the same key, then we will share the daily limit, huh? because the key identifies the caller, the user. And once you have the key, and to have it, you just need to apply, for example, on the website. And this is common for many services. Right? In order to call the interface, you need to have a, a registration on that website. But in, those, uh, in most of the cases, they don't ask you for username and password. It would be too bad to have your password embedded in the Python program to call the, the, the external service. So usually, when you apply, when you register, you get just a string of numbers. That will be the key. It's not something that contains sensitive information. It only gives you access to that service. For example, you just uh, uh, need to register here and uh, with email and, and password and you can get the, your key. Hmm? And once you have your key, well, there's a very, si a very similar method for getting the translations. The address is different. It's api.voicerss.org, question mark, and a set of parameters. And the parameters will be the key a text source for converting, to be converted. And HL stands for the language. And the other are optional. The, the mandatory arguments are the three one. By the way, the languages here are listed below. And for English, uh, there is no EN tag as for Google Translate. But you need to specify which variant of English you want. I didn't find English Italian, which is my, ver my version, but uh, all the other ones are present. So we have at least two options. Whether we use uh, Google Translate, an official API, or we may use the voice RSS official API with a message like this, api.voicesss.org slash question mark key, your key, this, of course it's a fake one, and source equal to hello, and language equal to this. So let's check if, if it's work.
Welcome to the Ambient Intelligence course. Okay. So I, wrote, I created this address with key, the key that I just applied for this morning. Source, uh, the source message is welcome to the Ambient Intelligence course. You see it here. The language for um, speaking the phrase is English. Hmm? Welcome to the Ambient Intelligence course. And this is what we get. So it's very similar in the same way this result is uh, an MP3 file. So we just need to change a bit uh, the address. We can choose different services. OK? They are already there. So right now, we know in by hand, in Chrome or in Firefox, how to get an audio file corresponding to our text. This is our text. I can save it. This message, I can save it on my desktop, for example. And if I go to the desktop, I should be able to find it. What is that? OK, it, it was just low. It just appeared here. And you can play it with any player that you have on your computer, for example. Hmm? So interactively, we are able to do the first step. But we need to be able to do it uh, inside Python. We need to learn how to call an external web page from within our program. We cannot just tell to the user, please write his address and save the file there. Hmm? So I, again, there are different levels at which we can solve this problem. Okay. For example, the first level is, uh, OK, this problem is easy to solve at the command line level, inside the terminal. In a Linux terminal, you can use, for example, the wget command, if you are familiar with that. wget means web get, so get a web page. You give the address, and wget gets the page and saves it in a local file. So one idea could be to figure out at wget command line to be called, and then try to use that command. And so the problem is, uh, OK, I, already, I again split the problem in two. First, figure out what is the right command line for wget. And the second half is, I, OK, if I know the command line, how can I invoke, I can run, how can I run wget from my Python program? OK, so it turns out that wget, OK, it's a Unix command. Uh, to understand how it works, you just go to a terminal and read the documentation. wget is a common blah, blah, blah. As sooner or later, you come up with some documentation to study. Always. OK? First, we understand that this tool can be of use to us, and then we need to learn how to use it. And uh, there's an option uh, saying like wget, uh, the name of uh, a URL, uh, the output file or directory, R means recursive, or something like that. 
and there's a lot, a long list of options about wget to change everything about its behavior. So it's uh, some thousands of lines, OK? You don't need to study it all today and now, but at least having an idea of what the tool does. But so we are confident that with the proper argument and options, wget can do what we need. And the second half is was uh, once I have the command line, I need to run it in a terminal to run the program. And so how can a Python program run a Linux program? It can, actually, with, with the help of the OS package. OS stands for Operating System. And inside the OS package, you will find all the functions to access the underlying operating system for reading files, for uh, checking directories, uh, for uh, mounting disks. And, and uh, by the way, there is a system function that uh, takes a string and just runs a program, runs a command, like you were in the terminal with that string. This is the simplest way. Using a tool, which is already there, so it's ready, and which, with the proper options, can call an address, a web address, and save the result in a file, and then execute that tool with just one line of Python, just a system command. So you will have your Python program that at some point, we'll call an underlying, an underlying shell at the Linux level, and this shell will run the program. If you need uh, to do something more robust, more complete, faster, or you want to have more control about that, there are specific packages for Python. For example, there is a wget package, and the name, of course, recalls that of a utility that does inside Python more or less what the wget command does in Linux. It takes a, a bit more to understand. Again, you need to check the documentation for that package. You may decide to use it. Or there is a uh, URL lib, URL library, that lets you do all sorts of uh, nice stuff with the URLs and the web pages and so on. We will use it later when, uh, when we learn about web technologies. So you will always find simpler or faster alternatives or more, let's say, complete, more robust, more integrated solutions. It's up to you to decide which way to go. So we have... Uh, most of what we need, just to just to summarize, what we what we did that we started with one problem, a program to speak a message, a text message. Okay, that was our original program problem. So. Do, you, do we know a tool for doing this? No. So let's split it into sub-problems. One sub-problem was a, a way for converting a string into an MP3, MP3 file, a spoken And the second problem is a way for playing an MP3 file from Python. And uh, a way for converting a string into an MP3 file, we found two options. Google and uh, VoiceRSS. 
But in both cases, we needed to solve, and so, sorry, uh, and so we, they have a specific uh, URL format. So we can learn about that URL format, get the API key, or get the trick to bypass the capture, whatever. And then we are left with two other sub-problems. How to call download a file from an URL. So we found out this format, and then we need to download the file from the URL. Again, we found different options using WooGet, using the WooGet packages, using the URL package. We decided for using WooGet, then it means how to build I will get command line. Uh, sorry, uh, yes. And how to run Buget from inside Python. How to run Buget from inside Python, we say that it's just a system call. How to build a Buget command line, uh, read the docs. We go deeper and deeper, and we get more and more details. The important thing is not to lose track of where we are in these three of decisions. And so we sort of solved the first half of the problem. And the second half is how to play the MP3 file from Python. Again, we, we decided, somebody told us, we searched the, the, the web for, or we searched uh, in, you know, Linux comments or whatever, we found and player. That could be a good option. And so again, we need to understand how to use and player. The documentation for and player is terrible. It, the, the command may be called in probably 20 different ways with different options, each because it can do anything. But again, it means that uh, we decided one option is to use uh, M player under Linux, M player with a Y. And then this means again solving two sub problems compose a proper command line and uh, run and player from Python. This, the second one we already know. And the first one we need to study the documentation. Okay, so I try to visualize my flow of thought with these three of options. Okay, so what we can do is to have a look, for example, at the at a running program that is already doing this. So we want to do a couple more exercises so we don't create it step by step here. I already have a solution, but just remember that, sorry, ROM file. A 
Okay. Can you read or is that too small? Maybe it's too small. Editor, fonts, and uh, make it 16. Oh. I can change it. Or I need to create a new scheme. Not really. So. Okay, is that better? A bit. So the idea is we have um, a Python command that in implements a function called say. Maybe I, I make it even a step larger. There's a function called uh, say. So I, we encapsulate the function of uh, speaking a given text in a given language that by default is the English language. OK, this is just a, a debug test. And so what, what do we need to do? We need to create the address to call on the Google Translate, for example and use that address into wget command. wget needs to be called then with the second. So this is the, uh, where the, the call actually happens. wget line. os.system execute this command. What is this command? The command is embedded into this string. wget line. And uh, actually, this came out after some trying, some work. It's not just something that you can write or have it right at the first trial. But first of all, you have the, the, the address, the URL. What web page are you calling? Translate.google.com, translate it yes. And uh, this is the encoding, if you want. TL is the language, TL equal English, in this case, and the query is the text. Text is the argument to the say function. And then we append our trick at the end, saying client, uh, this tweet, twob, or whatever, to make the service happy. This is the, the address. The address is an argument to the wget command. So you see here that we have a wget. Come with me, okay? A wget command output test.mp3 of this URL. So we are saying to wget call that page and save the output into this file, test.mp3. Uh, w minus Q means uh, be quiet. Don't write, don't. Uh, WGET usually prints everything it's, done, it's doing. Contacting website, downloading, file save, and so on. You don't want all that clutter on your terminal. And uh, this sets the user agents of the client hmm? so that Google is, is, is happier. So you need to, all of this can you know, be debugged and developed uh, on the terminal by command lines, of course, until you get it right. When you get it right, you encode that into a string, and then you call that string. After that, you have the file, and you want to play it. And we say that we can play it with Amplayer. Uh, and player, again, is a quiet option that doesn't print anything, doesn't open any window. 
just obeys and plays this file. And all the other messages are uh, no lyric means no, uh, don't take comments from infrared remote controls, of course we don't need one, uh, don't, don't write messages and so on. No? All messages are on level minus one means they are not, not to be printed. But this is just you know, fine tuning of the command line options. The key idea is wget this address into this file and save it into this file and do it here. And then after this line is executed, we are not really checking for errors here. So something may, get, may go wrong and we, we will not detect it. But for the moment, let's hope for the best. We have a, a file named test.mp3 at the same file may be played by a player. So this, this, that's all. There's a basic functionality that we need. What we need to do on top of that is just a, a small <coughs> user interface that queries a comment and then calls the save function. <coughs> queries for a message, for a text message, and calls the, the, the play function, the save function. And this is, for example, in this main. Let's try to always hmm, organize your Python code in this way. The, the file should define a set of functions. And then the, the actual program, the actual main program, is under this uh, line if name equal main. You know this already, right? No? OK, so I tell you. Uh, when you, with Python, with the Python interpreter, you write Python and the uh, tts.py, the Python interpreter reads all the file. Okay? And it executes all the comments it finds, all of them. Okay? In this case, it finds three instructions, four. Well, first is the import. Okay. Then there is this def statement, define a function. So from that point on, it reads only the lines for defining the function, but does not execute those. Okay. Third statement, define main, for example. The same, it defines a function. And then you have this if. If name equal main, name underscore, underscore, name, underscore, underscore. Hmm? If I, uh, the strange name for a variable. Underscore, underscore, name, underscore, underscore. Report the name of the module that is currently in execution, of the Python module. If we don't have any module, if we are not inside the module, it will tell us main. So the, the name of, of itself is underscore, underscore, main, underscore, underscore. So this question actually is, what is my name? If my name is main, then it means that I've been called from the command line. And so, therefore, only in that case, I execute these instructions. And so I run the main pro command, the main function. What may happen? That we may want, OK, so this is a sort of equivalent of putting all these texts right after the definition of the function. If we run it on the terminal, it's the same. But what if we want to reuse this module somewhere else? This function say may be useful in other cases, right? And how may we use this function in other programs? Ah, oh, we may copy and paste it. No, okay, never do that. This file, TTS, is a program, but is also a module. A module that can be imported in other programs. So in any other 
in any other program, you can say import TTS. Our module, our TTS file, this one. What does the import statement do from other files? It runs the file. It runs the file, so by running the TTS, Python is an interpreter language, so the only thing that can do is write and execute. It's read and execute. So it reads the file, executes the definition of the function, the definition of this main, but in this case, when this file is being read and executed from an import statement and not from the command line, the name will be the name of the module and not main. And so these instructions will not be executed. So you see what happens? If I import the TTS module, I'm just getting the functions defined, but n the main doesn't run. If I execute this file from the command line, not from an import statement, the main gets execute, executed. Okay? So in the same file, you can have a double life as a standalone program or as a module to be inserted. Only if we protect the main program under this if name equal main instruction. We'll see that in a second. Another program that imports this. So the idea is uh, if we want to, we, we, we like Python because it's easy to reuse other stuff, other programs. But we must we must write our own modules in a way that they are easier to test by themselves, and when they are working, they are easy to reuse in other programs. So, let's try. Let's try to, so you could run, you could run the, the file directly, run TTS, or, just to be more explicit, I run it in a, in a terminal. Uh, so even if you can do this, even on, on a terminal window, run the Python file is there, so we don't need uh, PyCharm for running everything. Python, tts.py. So there's a small prompt here. Oh, we didn't comment the main, but actually there's nothing interesting there. It's just a raw input and uh, uh, say command of, on that string. There's a bit of replacing spaces with, with pluses because the space cannot be part of an URL, but it's just stupid stuff here. And then you loop uh, until the user writes exit. Nothing fancy. <coughs> so I can say hello. Hello. And it speaks. works. Hmm? Exit. Goodbye. And it just replaces the string exit with the string goodbye because it's nicer to say. Okay? When we call the save function, we are somewhat forgetting what happens, that we are opening a web page, that we're saving a file, then we are launching two external programs, one get and one main player. It just says that. Of course, it can be improved in a thousand ways. You can replace the save function with something more clever, but right now with just three lines of program. It's difficult to make it shorter. Uh, we, at the beginning, we set up our goal to learn how to do fast prototyping with Python. Put this together quickly something that works. Okay, so for example, how can we... How can we uh, reuse what we did in another program? For example, we could, we could write a program that monitors your inbox folder 
for new messages. Your mail, your, your mail folder, and uh, it checks the messages that you have received and uh, are not being seen yet, being, being read yet, and just tells you how many messages you have uh, and the senders and the subjects of the message. Hmm? Somebody that reads uh, your new message, new mail messages. So again, we can split the problem in sub-problems. First of all is how to get the list of the, of the unread messages, because the second half I already have the solution for. We use the save function. Once we have a string that describes what are my messages, I just have to say that. And how to read messages from a mailbox. And it, this is not an, an easy task to do. You need to know a bit more about the mail protocols. And it, turn out, it turns out that the three, oh, sorry, the, um, the mail services usually give you three ways of accessing your messages. One is the old POP, POP protocol. Um, maybe some of you who set up your computer or you want to download the messages from the Polytechno server are using the POP. POP, what, uh, what, what the POP protocol does is to download the inbox from the mail server into your computer. There are two downsides. First, you need to, to transfer everything before you're able to read. And second, the messages get deleted from the server. And if you connect from a different computer, you don't see the message there. So it's actually not, doesn't scale to distributed computing where you may have different clients. So you may read the mail on the browser, on the, on the mobile, but it's the same mail that stays there. Never get downloaded into, and locked into a single device. The EMAP protocol is the, the solution. EMAP is a, a protocol, IMAP, for accessing remote mail. So a mail server has a lot of folders or mailboxes, if you want to call them. And uh, uh, each mailbox has different messages. And through EMAP, a client may connect to the server and check the messages in all the mailbox. It can move from one mailbox to the other, can delete them, and so on. And there is one special mailbox, which is called the inbox, that receives new messages. And all the others are just folders that the user can, can use. So this is the standard protocol for mail reading, for mail access, internet mail access protocol, IMAP for accessing mails over the internet. It's a complex. It's a bad guy. The, the, the definition of the IMAP standard is not so easy to read. Um, but maybe we don't need to read the specification of the protocol. We don't need to implement an IMAP client. We need just to understand the key concepts. And then, Unfortunately, there is a new world here, the cloud computing world, where you have different mail providers that use and provide their own special APIs. If you use a, a Google Mail on your phone, the Android application doesn't speak EMAP to the Google Mail servers. They have their own proprietary set of functions. If you open a Gmail window on your browser, all the JavaScript, the code running in Gmail, doesn't speak EMAP to the server. They have a special set of functions, an interface, a special interface. You can write tomorrow your own application using the Google libraries that is able to access Google Mail in a specific way that only works for Google Mail. It's their own custom proprietary API. So if you want to access a specific service, you may have 
depending on the service provider, either a standard protocol or a custom proprietary protocol to interact with that service. In this case, maybe one solution could be the IMAP protocol, which is standard, so most uh, providers support that. And if you search a bit, you find that there is a Python package, which is called IMAP, IMAP library, that gives you simple or more or less simple Python function for accessing an IMAP server. Okay, these are not, it's not easy to find this information. You first need to learn about uh, uh, main protocols and then f decide that IMAP is the best way to go and then find IMAP libraries and maybe find an easy to use one. Okay? IMAP libraries gives you messages. Each message is a long string. But we, we, are all, we all know that a message actually needs to be parsed because there's a sender, a receiver, a CC list, a subject, a body, the attachments. So having a message is not enough to be able to understand it or to speak it. You need to break it down into these pieces. So you need a way to break this long string of text into meaningful fragments. Who is the sender? Which is the subject? What is the date, for example? And there is another package in Python, which is called email, that does this job. There is an, um, uh, another standard that is called RSC 2822 that specifies the internal format of mail messages. So this email package understands RFC 822 and uh, the newer version 2822 and so on. And so helps you in breaking down the message in small pieces. So this is something that takes a bit of work, but hopefully we don't need to write our own IMAP protocol handler it would take one year at least to do that, and 10 years to do it correctly, because it's a nasty protocol. Nor our own parser for mail messages. We just use the libraries. I can show you one possible implementation. Which is here. So. I have this, uh, the main program, let's start for the main this time, that's query for a username and a password, and uh, loops uh, every 10 seconds, and every 10 seconds it, it checks, it calls the check mail function. What does the check mail function do? It's all the rest of the program. Finds the messages, and then speaks them, tts.say, tts.say, tts.say. You see that the, the say function is being used many times. So first, let's focus on this. How can I call the, a function from a different file? I just need to import the file name. tts is the name of our module. Now it's among other packages, which are standard packages or library packages, our own is among them. When you import TTS, it just reads all the definitions, read and executes all the file. You must be careful because if you didn't protect the main with this if statement, it would start executing the program. When you do the import, you don't want, you don't want that. You don't want that importing a module starts the main for that module. No. So you can import it, and you get only the definitions. The general rule is outside the main, only definitions. No statements, no executable statements. So just for importing, defines the save function. The save function is now called, since we just import the package, 
we must call it with a qualified name, tts.say. If we want it, if we want to be able to write it quickly, more quickly, just by saying say, say we need to write from TTS import say. That does the import and then renames the function, making it shorter hmm, without the prefix of the package. OK. And all the rest uh, is uh, nasty mail processing. So uh, connecting to the mail server, in this case, I'm reading my own email from the Polytechnic servers. So opening the connection to the mail server, it depends on the mail provider that you want to use. You may also use uh, the Gmail server, but then you need uh, to to check a long list of security parameters because Google Mail by default doesn't let you accept through email, through EMAP, sorry. You may enable that, but you need to configure it properly. And so the mail server, do the login, so open a login session on that server, select the inbox, all these commands, login, select, and search below are IMAP commands. Well, are library functions that call IMAP functions commands on the protocol. And so you get a list of email IDs searching from inbox all the messages that are being flagged as unseen. So not just unread. You never saw them. Okay, it's a different uh, one. Uh, the first time you see a message, it will be unseen. When you see the message in the list, uh, maybe it stays unread. You didn't read it, but you saw it. Hmm? So it's a different state. Delivered to the inbox, but never queried. The list of the, email, uh, of the unseen email IDs, and then if uh, you have more than one, you may get individual IDs, you must, this is a string splitting operation. And for each of them, for each of them, you can get, I'm just highlighting the most important passages, you, you get the content of the message. So up to now, we just read the list, and then we need to get a specific message. I have the ID, the first, second, third message ID. And for that ID, I fetch the message. The message is a big string, and we need to convert it from a string into a structure, sender, recipient, and so on. And so we use the email package that parses the message, message from, and creates a message object from which we can get this, the individual fields, the from field, the subject field, and so on. So, again, we need to learn about how to handle emails, but we can use it quite easily huh, with library functions. It's a matter of finding the right library function. And so, if we try to run it, it's fetch mail. Message one. You've got a new message from Andrea.Aquaviva at Polito.it with subject Survey Sol Consumo Electrico Domestico e Sol Efficiency or Energetic Message two. You've got a new message from with subject. It promotes Digital innovation. It doesn't read everything, probably because it gets confused by the quotes and so on. So it's not perfect, no? And it goes wrong. Okay, stop. Okay, so half of these messages are for, are for some of you about the, pro, the group project and so on. So I didn't reply yet. Don't, don't lose your faith. I will do that. Okay? 
So apart from the EMAP uh, complexity that will be meant, the idea is uh, I have libraries, I found the best ones, I learn how to use them. I have previous modules, previous functionality that I already developed, I can use them in the same way. Let me show you another example, something that will be useful because you can use it in the lab afterwards. Uh, I'm doing the same with Twitter. Twitter is easier eh, than, uh, than email. So I made a Twitter program that given uh, any hashtag that you want, searches the more recent Twitter messages with their tag, and uh, prints and reads the message aloud. So again, we should be already accustomed. Our first instinct would be, are there any Python, uh, Python Twitter libraries? How do we access twi Twitter? And if we find a Twitter library, a Twitter access library, one that is easy to use, hopefully, I can learn how to use this library, and I can plug it into the text-to-speech module that we already have. And it will be easy. OK? So there are several, more than one Twitter libraries, one even for Twitter themselves. Uh, we selected this one, for example, for this example. So we are using that. And it's already, uh, its, it's name, if you install it in Python, in the Python, in the PIP installer, is just Twitter. Hmm? Uh, so you see that, you know that um, some of these libraries that we are using may already be installed in your computer. And some may be not. So how do you install libraries which are not there? Actually, there are, you have two ways. One is through PyCharms. In PyCharms, you can go to the project settings. In the project settings, you have a, okay, the project item. Inside the project, you have a project interpreter that tells you which version of Python, if you have more than one installed in your computer, which is used for this project. And associated to this version, there's the list of packages of libraries that are installed on this interpreter. If, we, if you want to add one, just click on the plus. And you get the list, the full list of all the libraries in the Python repositories. OK, so if you want uh, Twitter, hmm, there are several libraries. And one of them is it's in blue because I already installed that. So it's already installed in, my, in this computer. But you find you just click to install package. So one way is through PyCharms. And the other way is through the terminal. When you just do a PIP install and the name of the package. So PIP will uh, query the, of course, you, you need to know the, the, the package name. For that, you need to search over the, the internet about the, the name. And uh, then you just install that, and it will get installed into the default uh, interpreter. Hmm? If you don't have uh, right permission to the, to, the, to the machine, it should save it into your local home uh, library, so the personal library of packages. So if you don't have some of the packages that you need, you can install them in either of these ways. It's the same, because at, at, the, at the end, they get installed into, into the Python interpreter. OK, so this guy is not a nice guy. Well, he is because he just uh, provided us with a nice uh, Twitter library. But if you go 
to this page, it tell, you know, and you search for documentation, how to use this, you don't find it. There's no documentation here. And uh, what you, what they say tells you is um, just install it and write help. So the idea of documentation by this guy is something like this. Python and help Twitter. Help gives you some help about every command, every variable, every type in, uh, in Python. And so you can get the documentation from this help page, which is not very useful or very easy to, uh, to read here. Uh, there is another way that you might find easier, because the source code in, is in GitHub. And we are happy that the readme of GitHub gives you a more, a more nicely formatted look at the same documentation. Uh, it's re relatively easy to use. It doesn't tell uh, you a lot of uh, details about each function. So you need to, be a uh, to do a bit of experimentation or reading the documents or reading the source for understanding the uh, just don't be, don't click on this link. Okay, it looks like a documentation page, but it's the documentation for Twitter, for the Twitter API. We will study it later. But then it's the HTTP level uh, documentation. We want the library level functions. But there are a lot of examples. It turns out that for accessing Twitter, you have to use their own API, of course, proprietary API. There's no, standard, no internet standard for Twitter. It's their ser service. And for accessing that service, you need to have four tokens, four secret strings. So the API key is made of four different parts. One that uh, a couple that identifies the user and a couple that identifies the permissions that this user has on Twitter. So, um, and you can go into the account settings of your Twitter page for getting, for creating your own set of keys. We already have one account that we use for the MEI course. It's called MEI course. You will have more detail in the lab later. And we created the uh, credentials for those. So if you want to use those instead of creating your own, just to be quicker in the lab. But then you can create your own, and so you can authorize your application to do what you want with your Twitter account, if you have one. And uh, what we wanted to do is to be able to, I said, uh, to search messages with a given hashtag and to print and speak them. Again, I use the same approach. Uh, so these are the, the, the keys to use uh, in our case. So what I get is uh, I read the hashtag, I call a function get tweets, and the function say tweets. The say tweets is nothing more than a loop over the tweets I received and calling the say message, the say function on those. We already know that. Get tweets opens the connection to Twitter. You need some time to read the documentation, to read the examples, to understand. So it, it creates an authorization object with the token and a Twitter object by passing the authorization token to it. TW is a connection to Twitter, and you have a, a search tweets function. You can search users, you can search uh, the um, popular topics, you can search about, and one of the search functions is search tweets. And you, you have the query string, 
what you would write in the search box in Twitter, hash symbol plus the hashtag string that was received here. And this results is a dictionary, actually, with two items. The first is the metadata that tells you how many results you have and so on. Well, when is the re most recent one? And the second voice in the dictionary is called the statuses. Status is a tweet in, la in Twitter language. Every tweet they call it status. So statuses is uh, the dictionary contains a key called statuses whose value is a list uh, of tweets. And so we can, every status have, has uh, different properties. A status, a tweet, as a sender, a date, a time, uh, and the text. Attachments, pictures, and the text. So we append into a list of strings just the text of the messages and return it. So you use the Twitter library for connecting to Twitter, querying about this hashtag, analyzing the results, and getting a list of strings. This list of strings is then spoken in a loop. So, if we want, we can tweet. Oh, no, it's in the wrong directory. Hashtag, I can choose uh, Monday. And let's see about, let's hear about the latest tweets uh, with the hashtag Monday. RT at the chive, me on hashtag Monday, https colon slash slash t dot co slash cathforge 20 jh. Need we say more? Today is the day to start the journey towards your dream. Hashtag Monday, hashtag motive, https colon slash slash t dot co slash suit fic for low https colon slash slash t. So we prepare some of these, let's say, toy examples for you in the lab in the next hours. So we can now stop here. I will publish this on GitHub. Uh, right now it's not yet there, sorry, but I will do that uh, if we don't uh, solve many questions. And uh, we move to the LADISP, where Theo is already waiting for us, uh, and uh, we have a text of exercises to do on the same topic. So you just can reuse this code and, uh, and these libraries. Thank you.